Glory. How many of y'all want to vic live a victorious life of Christ? You know, we, we talked about living a victorious life in Christ, and living a victorious life in Christ is actually a part of his benefits. It's one of his promises in covenant. But unless we're keeping covenant, we can't live a victorious life. And that, that means that we must be in divine order to live a victorious life. Because the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, doesn't he? Would you turn to 1 John chapter 5? 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. In other words, our confidence is in him, not in ourselves. That if we ask anything according to his what? His will, he hears us. So if you're asking somebody that's not according to his will, does he hear you? No, not that God's deaf. Hello. In other words, he doesn't acknowledge it. So everybody grab hold of this and says uh, that our confidence is in him, not in ourself. And that if we're asking for something according to his will, he hears it. But if it's not according to his will, he doesn't. And verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. So we know that he receives it because we know that it's according to his will. It says, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. In other words, he will pray for that person. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about it. Listen, if you see your brother fornicating, you don't need to pray about it. You need to go to him. If you see your brother breaking covenant, you don't pray about it. You go to him. Has everybody got it? Because if you don't, then you will be judged according to him because what you're doing is you're saying you're approving what he's practicing. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. <laughs> Amen. Don't pray about it. Go to him. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is sin not leading to death. Now, we know that sin is association with the presence of evil. But sin is also the self-imposed nature, which is the offspring of darkness. It is the self-imposed nature, the offspring of darkness. It is the old man. Verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not, what? Sin, because if you are in a born-again state of being, that means that you are in the spirit. The self-imposed nature does not have dominion over the divine nature of the new creation in you. But he who has been born of God keeps himself. And the wicked one does not touch one, does not touch him. In other words, he keeps himself from allowing the self-imposed nature to become alive again. He keeps himself from those things that feed the old man. Because what you feed is what you allow to come alive again. So you and I are to continuously starve the old man. Verse 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the influence around me and you is always to promote sin. The self-imposed nature. The old man. And we know and, and, and we know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true and his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So if anybody ever wants to know who God is, tell him his name is Jesus. <laughs> Little children, keep yourselves from what? Idols. Keep yourselves from idols. Why? Because they influence the self-imposed nature. They influence the self-imposed nature. In other words, if we ask according to his will, it's not sin. Do you know that asking not according to his will is sin? Does everybody understand that? Because it's an area where you want to promote unrighteousness. So we're to keep ourselves from worldly desires, which are called idols. Worldly desires are idols. 
They prevent a victorious life in Christ and they promote a self-imposed nature. We got to keep ourselves from these things. How many know that you could be your worst idol? But see, we are, if we're really in the spirit, we're going to discern these things. It doesn't mean that we won't make a mistake, but we're going to overcome it. It means that when we begin to, because see, the Holy Spirit always puts border lines in our life. There are border lines that he sets up. So in this, we, in this area where the Holy Spirit sets up boundaries, there are boundaries of worldliness. And we have a teaching on this. And what happens is the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the path is narrow to those who are walking upright. So he has a narrow path for me and you. Because what he does is as you earn his trust, he begins to expand that path because he knows that he begins to expand the boundaries because he knows that you know now not to go into those areas that can promote an idol. Because the enemy is always trying to promote idols in our life so that we, have, we don't have that victorious life so that he has access to us. But the Bible says that Jesus came to bring his life abundant. And in this life abundant, it means that we have a victorious life. It's got nothing to do with materialism. We'll talk about that in a second. But what the enemy is trying to do is always promote idols. Your job can be your idol. Anything that you are dependent on. Your spouse can be an idol. Your children can be idols. Anything that is in between you and God is an idol. Has everybody got it? Is, uh, let's go to Ezekiel 14. Addiction is an idol, isn't it? How about cigarettes? Alcohol? Drugs? Pornography? fornication, adultery. All of these things are idols because it promotes self. Ezekiel 14. In verse 1, let's read this together. Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of, of, of at all by them? Now, listen, this is powerful because he says, listen, you know, people put so much dependency on finances. It's become an idol. Listen, I'd rather be poor and have the riches of God than be wealthy and not have the riches of God. I'd rather know him and be poor. Does everybody understand that? Then not know him and be rich. Because the riches of the world produce nothing. That's all it does is promote fear. <laughs> the people are always trying to hold on to what they have. Anything that you're afraid of letting go to, go from, is an idol. Anything that you're afraid of letting go of is an idol. Verse 4. Therefore, speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, every one of the house of Israel sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. That I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. Therefore, I say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent. Turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes them to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man. And make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. In other words, he will make him an example. Does everybody understand that? That doesn't mean he won't forsake him, but he'll be an example. In verse 9. And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. And they shall bear their iniquity and the punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired. 
that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord. So idols are in the heart. They are a desire. And it will cause separation from the will of God. So we must, that's why the Bible says, examine yourself. In other words, you can always tell what your idol is and what you pour more time to. Is your mindset on the things of God? What, you know what? What is your mindset on? If your thoughts are set more on the things of God than the things of the world, then you have dominion over idols. But if your thought is more set on things that amuse you, more things that promote you, more things that bring fulfillment to you, instead of the things of God, then those things are idols. There's a difference between pleasing God and pleasing man. The Bible says, blesses the man who trusts in the Lord and curses the man who trusts. I mean, blesses the man who trusts in God and curses the man who trusts in man. Amen? And right now, the influence all around us is trying to promote idols in us in every area. You know, from the moment that you were born into this world, idols were always being impressed in you. You know, I remember being brought up, and one thing that always was said, you got to get an education to be somebody. Well, being somebody was an idol. <laughs> God said, you already are somebody. I didn't need to prove to anybody who I was. But the world tries to promote that, doesn't it? You know, people with their talents and abilities, that's awesome because those things came from God. But when you rely on your own talents and abilities and not acknowledge that they came from God, they become idols. Because the word says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, not through our talents and abilities. Amen. So we must be careful of that. And it's being promoted more and more right now. The influence of the world. Now you got to look at the world is considered outer darkness in the physical realm. But there's a spiritual realm called outer darkness, isn't there? So the influence of the world is trying to promote idols in me and you to establish desires so that we are enticed with temptations and fall astray and begin to separate ourselves from God. You know, I want to share something with you. To be a man pleaser is a terrible place to be. But to be a God pleaser is the place God is looking for. Because he's always looking for him and us. He's not looking for you. He's looking for him and us. Amen. Philippians 3. Everybody okay? Philippians chapter 3. Starting at verse 1, please. Philippians 3, verse 1. Hallelujah. Let's speak this together. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So Paul said, listen, I'm, I know you've been hearing from me a lot on this subject, <laughs> but I've got to remind you because of the influence. Do you know that associations can influence you too? Amen. Verse 2. Beware of what? Dogs. Now, biblical interpretation of the word dogs means individuals that are demonized. Demon-controlled individuals. Those are called dogs. It's amazing to me and how the enemy always starts slangs and terminology in the world people call each other a dog hey dog what's happening a dog means demonized individual <laughs> so don't let anybody call you a dog break it off <laughs> you're not a dog you're a servant of the most high god it says beware of dogs beware of evil workers beware of mutilation for we are the circumcision who worship god in the spirit rejoice in christ jesus and have no confidence in the flesh you have no confidence there 
Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So Paul's expressing to himself, listen, I used to have confidence in the flesh, but let me explain this to you. He said, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Again, no confidence in the flesh, which is an idol. Amen? Not self-reliance or self-will. Now listen, God uses people in the measure that they are not trusting in themselves i'm going to say this again god uses people in the measure that they are not trusting in themselves he does not use people that are trusting in themselves if there's parts of your life that you're trusting in you that is the measure does everybody understand that? So if you trust in 80% of you, God can only use 20% of you. If you're trusting in 90% of you, God can only use 10% of you. So in this, we've got to understand that these idols and the self-reliance and the self-will are influenced from the enemy to promote desires in me and you that nullify a victorious life in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 26. First Corinthians 1 verse 26. Let's speak it out. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh... Not many muddy, not many noble are called. Aren't you glad? <laughs> We'd have never made it. <laughs> but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are what? That are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and the righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That it is as written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So God uses the weak and the foolish. In this, in the weak, he manifests his power. So in this, his power is released to those who are weak and foolish. In other words, because they are not self-reliant. They realize, I can't do this. I'll never forget one day this woman came up to me who was paralyzed. She was paralyzed all on one side of her body. And we just got done praising and worshiping, and I opened my eyes, and this woman was standing in front of me. And she was asking me to pray for her, but her speech was... Impaired because of her being paralyzed. And she said, pray for me. And I looked at her and I looked at the Lord and he said, don't worry about it. It's not you. <laughs> so I prayed for her and God healed her. And she ended up throwing her cane because she was paralyzed on one side. She ended up throwing her cane and started running around the church because God had healed her. See, but the one thing was, is I, I looked at the Lord and I said, Lord, I can't do this. He says, you're right. He says, remember, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> and then he healed her. 
Man, I love seeing that stuff happen. Praise God. So what he's saying, I will release my power when you come to the end of you. Amen. And, and what, so we got to come again to understand that idols. Idols promote self. And then these idols, they prevent a victorious life because we're trusting more in the idols than we are God. Amen. Many people only know the battle between the spirit and the flesh. But they don't understand the battle between the believer and evil spirits. Because evil spirits promote these idols. So many times people are blaming the flesh. But the flesh is being enticed by spirits. In fact, every idol has an associated evil spirit. Has everybody got it? Because the Bible says we're not fighting flesh and blood. So people, many people just put it off. Oh, it's, it's just the flesh. No. If the flesh is being manifested, it's because there's something there influencing it to be manifested. And it's called an evil spirit. Because either the Holy Spirit is influencing us or evil spirits are influencing us. Listen. The highest expression of spiritual life is to deny oneself and the flesh that is associated with these evil spirits. The Bible says that you and I are to expose them. Amen. We are to what? Expose them to remove them. But so many people are just, oh, it's just a flesh. Oh, it's just how I am. No. If you know that the character in you is not the character of Christ, if the character of Christ is not being manifested and another character is being manifested, that means that there's an influence of an evil spirit. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five and starting at verse one. See, self and flesh love to be unified. <laughs> they're one. <laughs> self and flesh, they're one. So that's why the only thing that you can do is continue to be led by the Spirit so the flesh can be crucified and nullify the works of the flesh by exposing the spirits that are promoting idols and influencing the flesh to become alive. Amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, We know, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desire to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent Grown, in other words, because of the flesh around us and the selfish nature, that sinful nature, known self-imposed nature. Being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but be what? Further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has also given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home, in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether to be present or absent, but to be what? Well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what has been done, whether good or bad. So in this, the Bible says that the tent of the flesh <laughs> desperately wants to be clothed more and more and more with the things of the world. Amen? But we want to be more clothed with the glory of God and less clothed with the things of the world. So sometimes you're groaning and don't even know why you're groaning. Sometimes you also become miserable. Man, you know what? I'm just really tired of this. And that's because you're burning through your soul. You're just burning through. These things are just burning through. And that's where it's so important that you begin to praise and worship the Lord so that the anointing can come and break. Break these things. Break these idols. Expose these things so you're not promoting the flesh. Amen? And he says that we walk 
by faith and not by sight. In other words, we walk by faith, not according to the flesh. We walk by faith, not according to the flesh. Amen? In Romans 10. We're getting somewhere. We had to lay the foundation to get to where we got to get to. Romans 10, verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Now, what's the word believe mean? Follow. So he who follows won't be put to shame. There's a lot of people say they believe, but they don't follow. So they're really not believers. Verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without someone telling them? A preacher or anyone else. Amen. Everybody is a preacher when you become a believer. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Unless they are what? Everyone say sent. Sent. Mm, hold on to that. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings to the, of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out to all of the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I say, did Isaiah not know? First Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found in those who did not seek me. I was made manifest in those who did not ask for me. But to Isaiah, he says, all day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now, this is powerful. and I'm, We're going to grab hold of this. He says, so faith comes by hearing, not by assuming. Faith comes by hearing, not by assuming. That's why he says, those who have been sent. Listen, faith is based on the finished work of Christ. Amen? Faith is based on the finished work of Christ. While, while obedience is based on the current work of the Holy Spirit. So faith comes by hearing. Does everybody understand that? So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's because of the finished work of Christ that he speaks to me and you. Now we must obey him because it's now the work of the Holy Spirit that has empowered me and you to obey. So God doesn't approve of people going to work for him until he sends them. He does not approve workers of the Lord unless he sends them. If you have not been sent to do the work of the Lord, then you're out of order. Many people are going out there trying to do the things of God that God's not sent them to do. And if they've not been sent, that is called the sin of presumption. It is sin to go out and do the things that God has not sent you to do. Is everybody okay? He will not approve. That's why the word says... And all of the works will be burned, won't they, that are not of God. Amen. So if you're out there doing the works that you're saying you're doing, God has sent you, you better be sent by God or it will burn up. And that is called the sin of presumption because you did not hear, you assumed. And these things promote idols. Is everybody with me? They promote what? Idols, because if you have not been sent, then you are assuming and you are now the idol. Come on, this is the trick of the devil, that's why. 
You know, people go out there, listen, the worst thing you can do is be successful in the wrong assignment. Assumption. 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 Many people assume. You know, that's why the Bible says, seek ye the kingdom of God and all things will be added to you. They assume. Every one of us has fallen in assumption one way or another. Even, I don't care how long you've been a believer, the enemy will try to s snag you into that idol of assumption. Believing that you heard from God to do when you didn't. But you know the end result is always manifested. Whether it's of God or not. Because it will maintain. Amen. The sin of a presumption is the same as the sin of rebellion. And it will prevent a victorious life. Is everybody okay? Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. The sin of presumption is the same as the sin of rebellion. And it will prevent a victorious life. Psalm 19. Hallelujah. How many of y'all know that your desire can speak louder than the voice of God? So if that idol is a desire and the desire is an idol, that idol can speak louder than God sometimes. Are you listening? Vital. Important. There are things that people are doing. And going to places thinking that God has sent them and it's not God. Because it's not promoting divine order. Where there's divine order, you can that's the fruit of doing the will of God. Does everybody understand? Where there's not divine order, it cannot be God. It's impossible. So if there's not fruits of divine order, it can't be God. Hello. Psalm 19 and verse 12. You know, it's amazing how people will fight for the idol and not fight for the will of God. Because <laughs> they don't want to be proven wrong. Because the idol promotes pride also. So they have to prove themselves right. And that's also associated with control. Oh, we can go on for days with this. <laughs> Psalm 19, verse 12. Let's read it. Let's speak it. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my what? Secret faults. Keep back your servant also from what? Presumptuous sins. Things that we assume are of God. Let them not have what? Dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I think we need to repent right now. I think we need to take care of this right now. Come on, everybody repeat it after me. Holy Father, forgive me. Have mercy upon me. For every presumptuous sin associated in my life. Every time I said I heard from you, when it wasn't of you, I repent and I ask for your forgiveness. And I break the curse off and command every associated spirit with these presumptuous sins that is promoted rebellion to loosen, to leave me right now in the name of Jesus. And I ask Lord now. Give me ears to hear and a heart to receive. Cleanse me from all presumptuous sin that I may be blameless in Jesus' name. Awesome. Remember, presumptuous sins are associated idols of desire promoting the rebellious works of flesh. Are you listening? They will 
their their purpose is to interfere with the will of God so we do not live a victorious life. A victorious life is fulfilling the will of God. Amen? Go to Deuteronomy 1. The sin of presumption. That's the name of the title, in case you might want to know. Deuteronomy chapter 1. In verse 30. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as man carries his son and all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. And the Lord heard the sound of your words. And it was angry and took an oath, saying, Surely not one of these men of these, this evil generation so see that good land, which I swore to give to your fathers. Why? Because they were grumbling and complaining, and they were speaking assumptions and not truth. Verse 36. Except Caleb, the son of Jephiah, who he shall see it and to him and his children I am giving the land on which he walked because he wholly followed the Lord wow remember believers to what follow the Lord was also angry with me for your sake saying even you shall not go in there Joshua the son of Nun who stands before you he shall go in there encourage him for he shall cause Israel to inherit it Moreover, your little ones and your children, who you say will be victims, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess it. By, but as for you, turn and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then you answered and said to me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight just as the Lord our God commanded us. And when every one of you had girded on his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, Tell them, Do not go up nor fight, for I am not among you, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you, yet you would not listen, but rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went up into the mountain because they believed that God was with them when he wasn't. He did not send them to fight this battle. They went on their own and they lost. And the Amorites who dwelt in that mountain came, came out against you and chased you as bees do and drove you back from Seir to Hormah. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice nor give ear to you. So you remain in Kadash many days, according to the days that you spent there. They lost the battles, not by being sent or approved by God. Because everybody got it. It wasn't God's time. And it prevented a victorious life. So many times you're trying to fight a battle that God's not told you to fight. There are battles that we are to lay down. And only fight the ones that he tells us to fight. That's why it's important to be a first striker every morning. Binding all powers of darkness and so forth. That's why you must have a prayerful life. If you are not one who prays in the morning. Then you don't have a prayerful life. And you cannot live a victorious life. And you will live a life of assumption. And you will find out that the day that all the works are judged. They will burn. You cannot live a, a, a presumptuous life. A presumptuous life is not a victorious life. It is not the life of Christ. It is the life of self. James chapter 4. The sin of presumption is the same as the sin of rebellion. Too many believers are caught in assuming. They're hoping that because they have a feeling or an unction or they hear something, that it's of God. They never. It, uh, that's why it's important to get things confirmed. 
you don't run on every whim. Because many times, even when God speaks to us and tells us something to do, he expects us to ask us, when then? When, Lord? When? If he doesn't answer you, it's not now. <laughs> James chapter 4. We must come out of a presumptuous life of sin. Hallelujah. James 4.13. Let's speak it. Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there. Buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. If the what? Lord wills. Instead, you shall say, if the Lord wills. Verse 16. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin because it is assumption. Amen? It is what? Assumption. Only if the Lord wills. The Lord wills. You know, one, of the, one day the Lord was sharing with me. He said, my people, some of my people are eating junk food. It blew me away. I said, what do you mean by junk food? He said, because they're going into places of Bible study that I've not sent them. I thought it was pretty weird. I'm thinking, well, Lord, Bible study is Bible study. Isn't word to know the word? He said, only if I send them is it become food to them. If I'm not sending them there, it's junk food. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. Why? Because junk food promotes pride and arrogance. Does everybody get this? It promotes flesh. It is called junk food. Because God has not sent us there to eat. It's like going to the right restaurant. Anybody gone to a restaurant where the food stunk? But everybody promoted it? Man, it's got a lot of promotion on TV, all kinds of stuff. You got good coupons, cheap food. It's supposed to be really good. And you went there and your meal stunk. You know why? You shouldn't have gone there to eat that day. God didn't send you. Your flesh did. Okay, let's go to John 10. You know, God tests us at the strangest time. <laughs> you know, it's amazing because, you know, uh, especially during the holidays and stuff or, or any time, you know, whatever. You know, you get a visitation from family members. You know, like I, I, I get uh, all of a sudden I, my, my brother will show up or, or somebody show up, my somebody, my daughter or whatever and so forth. And the first thing they want to do is they want to go do something. But I tell him, no, I can't go because God doesn't interrupt himself. I'm supposed to be at the Bible study or the service. Are you listening? This is where God tests us where we're at. Now, there are times when he says go. Do you understand that? There are times when whatever. But there are times when he says, I'm going to check you out. Yeah, I said one. I said, okay, before, but I'm not saying it today. See, this is where people just assume. They assume it. They don't pray about it. They just assume it and go and do it. Oh, but it's my family. Oh, it's my children. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. Well, then they're your idols. God tests us. And, you know, so many times we're waiting on God to do something. He's saying, when are you going to be obedient? When are you going to get in divine order and get rid of these idols? Because divine order cannot be established with idols. It always promotes assumption and promotes flesh. Is everybody okay? James, uh, John 10.10. 10. Let's speak it. Come on. The thief. Who's the thief? The devil. 
The thief does not come except to what? Steal. To kill and to destroy. Hallelujah. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it what? More abundant. Now listen, I'm going to share with you that life abundant is not riches. <laughs> people think that they, uh, people are looking, Lord, you said you give me life abundant me and they're expecting their garages to be full of jewelry. <laughs> or their bank accounts overflowing. Abundant life is a mature life. It is a victorious life. Are you listening? It is not a material life. It is a divine scene of reality. I want everybody to grab hold of this. It is a divine scene of reality and a realm of spiritual experiences. That's abundant life. It's not how much money you have. It's not the car you drive. It's not the motorcycle you drive. It's not the clothes or your jewelry. It's none of that is abundant life. The greatest abundant life you and I can have is spiritual experiences with the richness of Christ Jesus and knowing who he is. Because when you really know who he is, you know who you are. Everything else is vanity and temporary. You know, it's wonderful. I mean, it, you know, we spend a day together. We have fellowship. It's wonderful. You know, but then it goes away, doesn't it? But the things that don't go away are the things and the riches and experience in the spirit realm with Christ Jesus. That's life abundant. Amen. That's why he so desires me and you to deny ourselves. Let's take off the old. Pick up the cross, putting on the new man. And following truth, being led by the Spirit so our flesh is crucified. So the idols are being exposed in our life. Examine ourself. Amen? Examine ourself. You know, when you have a dream from the Lord. And he visits you in a dream. Isn't that a wonderful experience in the Spirit? Man, the Lord spoke to me last night. Man, I heard his name when he woke me up. These things are riches of God. They're the riches. Amen. Yes, we need money. Hello. Unfortunately. But money is the God of the world. The world serves money. <laughs> money should be serving me and you. Amen. We're not to be a servant to money. Philippians 4. And we'll close here. Sin of presumption. Philippians chapter 4. Again, anything you're not willing to let go of is an idol. <laughs> is everybody there? Philippians chapter 4. Glory to God. In verse 4. Let's speak it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Now this be anxious for nothing. Listen where there's idols there's anxiousness. He says, but listen, be anxious for nothing but in everything prayer, prayer, prayer. So one of the things you want to find out, Lord, is this of you? No, not my will, but your will. One of the things we need to pray is that the enemy, dis that the enemy dis be destroyed in every area that God is trying to manifest his will in us. Amen. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God in the peace of God, not the anxiousness of the en enemy. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Go to verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are what? True. Whatever things are noble. Whatever things are just. Whatever things are pure. 
whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, our good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen? And you will lack nothing. We must come out of the realm of presumption. S assuming can kill you. That is a ploy of the enemy. That's why call somebody. Hey, man, this is what was put on my heart. Get confirmation. Don't just run at anything. You know, one day the Lord said to me, uh, guy, I, um, I want you to, uh, and this is wild, I want you to go to this event. Well, I was invited to this event and chose not to go. So I come in and I, I go, wait, I think I need to go to this event. He said, well, the event was last Friday. <laughs> so I repented. <laughs> because I assumed that I wasn't supposed to go. Are you listening? I believed I wasn't supposed to go, but I didn't wait for confirmation because I was supposed to go. And I went to service that night. And I irritated my leg that was already hurt. And the Lord didn't want me to go because he knew I'd jump around and dance around and become a fool again. Because I'm a fool for Christ. But he didn't want me to go. But I assumed that he would want me to get in his presence. But he want me to be at this other event. So when I said to Wade, man, I think I need to go to this event. He said it was last week. I thought, oh, God, I miss it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I repent. But that's the beauty of relationship, isn't it? You repent. And you get back in divine order. That's all. It's that simple. But the whole thing is beginning to recognize it and see it. You know, God will bring up things that you were supposed to do and didn't do and that you assumed. And he's going to bring them up. And I'm telling you now, if you're going into prayer, you're going to start finding some things in the next few days. The things that you were supposed to do, you didn't do and you assumed that he's going to allow you to break it off. Because it brings a self-imposed curse. Because he's desiring to have you live a victorious life and be life abundant. And be careful. Unless you are sent, it's not God. Amen? Unless you are sent. Start it off with prayer. Every day. Pray. If you're not a person of prayer, you will live in assumption. And you will not live a victorious life. It's impossible. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Again, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness on every area of assumption and the sin of presumption. We break that off of us in all areas of idols that have promoted and enticed the desire to assume. Lord, expose these things in our life that we may walk in the spirit free from the entanglements and affairs of this world. Free from fear. Free from bondage. Free from torment. And free from ourselves. That Christ would not be suppressed, but expressed. And that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Hallelujah. Give God glory.